All right, everyone, thanks for joining today. Let's go ahead and get started. So welcome in partnership with Health Services Advisory Group and as part of the Train the Trainer workshop series for skilled nursing facility educators, the California Department of Public Health Healthcare Associated Infections Program presents today's office hours to review infection prevention and control training implementation strategies for environmental services staff. I'm Erin Garcia. I'm the HEIAR Prevention Project Supervisor at the CDPH HEI program. And I'm joined today by our nurse educators and infection preventionists at the HEI program, Aurora Avalos, Shannon Malenzak, and Chantal Ahanya. Wave hello, everybody. <laughs> We're excited to have you all here today. So a few housekeeping reminders. This session is being recorded. We will post a copy of the recording plus the slides from today on our Train the Trainer webpage. And this is an open and safe space for sharing and idea exchange. We want to remind everybody of that. We really want to invite you to ask questions, share your experiences, and discuss any facility-specific barriers, concerns, or and successes as well um, that you have with implementing IPC training among your EVS staff. We find that that will help. That can only help really strengthen each other and, and make uh, a, give you support. Um, we encourage you to type any questions or comments in the chat or raise your hand um, and unmute during the discussion later on today. We will also compile an anonymized Q&A document and post it on the Train the Trainer workshop um, as a resource, um, or excuse me, on the re resource page as a, as a reference. Um, and this is really, if we don't get to all your questions today, we really want to have those answers for you. So we'll get that um, on the website. So here's the agenda today. Um, this is really an opportunity to expand upon last week's workshops. We have wonderful guest panelists today uh, joining um, to talk about their experience with implementing EVS training programs in their facilities. We'll also talk through some case scenarios. We'll engage in some of those activities that we started doing last week, and then we'll have some time for question um, and answer at the end. We'll also cover some of our frequently asked questions from last week's workshops that we didn't get to. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some next steps. So I think that I'm gonna pass it over now to Shannon. Thanks so much, Erin. So as you all might remember, last week we reviewed your role as an EVS educator. As an educator in your facility, you should understand IPC prevention concepts specific to EVS staff, assess and reassess staff IPC training needs, be familiar with available IPC training materials and tools for EVS, and provide IPC prevention training to EVS staff. As a review in last week's Train the Trainer workshops, we discussed the EVS staff's role in preventing infection and protecting residents in skilled nursing facilities. We also reviewed EVS IPC curriculum and training methods and discussed methods to assess and reassess staff's IPC training needs, like adherence monitoring and feedback. We also navigated the EVS toolkit and implementation guide. I now invite Chantal Ahanya, infection preventionist, to introduce our panelists and lead our panel discussion. Okay, can you guys hear me? Thank you, Shannon. Um, let's go with the next slide. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for having us. And thank you for attending the uh, presentation. And I'm going to introduce three of my very good friends and I've been working with them for a few years, for a couple of years. Um, I hopefully um, they don't have any issues with their sound. Um, Alejandro Martinez, uh, he's from River Bend Nursing Center. He's the EVS manager. Um, and I have uh, Tracy Hansen, infection preventionist from Madison Grove. And um, uh, Kelly Dextra uh, from Environmental Director and, Cent uh, and Central Supply Director from English Works Nursing and Rehab. Uh, hopefully, they are all a don't have any technical difficulties. With that, uh, we'll go to the first question to our panelists. Alex, I'm going to start with you. Hopefully, uh, Tracy had some technical issues, so she'll be able to work it out. Um, so how did you develop your IPC training program for EVS staff, um, Alex, when you started working with your staff? What, what materials did you use? Uh, 
Hi, everybody. Yeah, let me know if you can hear me. Okay. <clears throat> yes, we can. We can hear you. Go ahead. You can hear me? Okay, sorry. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Chantal. Good, good morning. Uh, yeah, so for the first question, uh, how did we develop uh, IPC training program for EBS staff? It was definitely a combination of uh, definitely teamwork with uh, our IP SAM. We developed uh, different policies and procedures that were in place in our facility and, uh, you know, making sure that uh, our EBS staff was always uh, attending these in-services. In-services were very important in this, uh, in implementing and developing this training as well. You know, monitoring and uh, doing daily rounds also was very helpful in this uh, process. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Tracy, if you can hear me. So how did you develop IPC pro training program for your staff at your facility? I think maybe we still have a problem there. Um, okay, so I will go to my next panelist, um, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. So um, how did we develop our IPC training for, um, for it to be effective for my EVS staff? Um, the first thing is, you know, I think we we do follow our generations policies and procedures that were drawn up. Um, and then with that, I kind of adapted it to um, our facility Pacific um, and using my tools to in service. I appreciate your guys's modules as well. Um, you know, I think my staff learned a lot with that. They did some hands-on training. They were very excited. Well, they were nervous at first, but I think they all, you know, they all came around. And um, again, you know, we collaborated after you folks had left our facility and asked the questions, what did you learn today? And what could we do different that we don't already do? And, um, you know, I think that um, that's how we developed it. Also working with our IP nurse um, in-house. Um, she's very knowledgeable as well as if, if I have any questions in doubt, I will turn to her and ask her the questions. And we collaborate as a team to, to get down to, well, this is really how you should be performing. Um, and then get my staff involved in that follow-up. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, Tracy, Tracy, I'll circle back to you. Are you able to uh, resolve your technical difficulties? Uh, I see there is uh, 747265. They have raised their hand. I'm not sure if they okay. want to come up of mute. Yes, yes, I can hear you. I'm Gazole. Okay. That's not Tracy. You can right? hear me? Yes, yes. No, I'm not Tracy. I'm Gazole. Okay. Thank you so much. We saw your hands up. So um, I think we are having difficulty to uh, uh, hear Tracy. So let's go with the next question. Um, Alex, this goes back to you. How did how do you prepare your staff to implement evidence based IPC practices uh, in your facility? You know, um, they know how to clean the room, but do they know what is the? Do they understand the CDC guidelines? So, how did you prepare them to understand uh, uh, what is the cleaning process should look like? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Shantala. Thank you. So uh, in order to prepare our staff, I think one thing that was very helpful for us in our facility was uh, doing assessments like before going into the rooms, before we're starting to clean the rooms, I mean, uh, doing an assessment and see, uh, you know, how many patients we have uh, in that room. Uh, is the patient inside the room? Is the patient out of the room? Things like that were very helpful. Uh, also, like I said uh, before, uh, training was, uh, definitely a big tool that play a big role uh, in this uh, in implementing these uh, practices you know uh, having 
more than two or three staff uh, ready for this type of, for example, terminal cleaning. Uh, sometimes it was really hard to have everybody uh, together at the same time. So it was necessary to have more than one in service uh, <clears throat> in order for this to happen. You know, sometimes we had to uh, go back and monitor again or go back and uh, follow up with them. Uh, definitely uh, daily rounds, like I said before, uh, was also very helpful uh, for me as an EVS manager to see and uh, make sure that, that these uh, practices were actually uh, happening. So definitely monitoring and uh, assessment before going into the room was something that was uh, helpful for us uh, to implement these practices. Thank you, Alex. Kelly, um, how did you prepare your staff? Okay, so um, kind of when um, they do their clock in, they they all report to myself for their assignments. They they know what Pacific Wings are responsible for, but just to give them any updates on any perhaps new isolation rooms, um, what are they on? Are they on the contact? Are they on um, the droplet? Are they on, I'll say the red, we don't want that in the building, but, um, or the code purple. So again, what, what, what are each one of the Pacifics? Um, I also, before um, we did our modules, I created some um, cheat cards. So on each housekeeping card, they do have their um, cheat cards to where if they're ever in doubt of, what they should be doing for the day. Anybody that walked into the facility, I'm hoping could, you know, again, pick up that cheat card and run with it. Um, and um, just again, collaboration, I think is important at the beginning of their shifts for any new updates and any new practices that they have to follow for the day. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, you mentioned about the cheat card. So do you have specific one for uh, daily room cleaning versus uh, deep cleaning versus a terminal cleaning, or is it in general? Um, mine is for their general cleaning. Um, however, whenever I, if I have a new hire um, for discharging, we in service quite frequently for all staff to be in service and trained their practices for deep cleaning. Um, and, and that's important that you just don't have one person with that knowledge base, you have the whole group. Um, and again, they can collaborate with each other if something wasn't clear or it's like, oh, what do I do here? Um, but it's, I'm gonna say it's a general classification to meet all the needs of what do we do along with our policies and procedures. When we hold our end services, each one of them um, actually get the policy um, and our guidelines um, to, to fully understand, understand each and every step that, that we go through. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask both Alex and Kelly, both of you, I know we don't have it in the question, but I know you both have uh, experienced the, the barrier. A lot of people have a question regarding language barrier. Um, how did you address, um, I know Alex can speak Spanish, so then he is fine, so Kelly, I do. How? Okay. No, you do. Okay. I don't. So, no. You I don't. don't. So, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. So um, again, it, it, thank you. If somebody isn't understanding, I do have folks in my department that will speak a secondary language and I will have them step in for me. Um, and my translator then will repeat in English. So I'm kind of understanding the directive that was followed through and given to that employee. Um, again, that may to the, the Alex, how about you? I think Alex, Alex, you're on mute. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, in my case, Chantala, uh, definitely, uh, you know, being able to speak Spanish to my uh, housekeepers was very helpful. Uh, you know, making sure that they understand all the policies and procedures was very important for me. So, of course, we had to make sure, uh, you know, 
like I said before, we did different in services uh, in English for the people that uh, you know speak English, but also in Spanish for those that understand Spanish better. Uh, we also uh, use other co-workers in the building that could uh, speak a different language if it wasn't, but one part we got it covered with those two. So definitely having two different in services in, in one in English and one in Spanish was also helpful. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. I know um, I'm not sure if Tracy is still able to join or having still difficult. Um, we'll move on uh, to the next question. This, uh, Alex, uh, describe how did you engage your staff um, you, uh, to ensure the IPC practice are implemented in your facility? You gave an example, like you have been, uh, you do the rounds and the daily rounds and you talk to them, you do the in-service. Um, so, you know, you have some staff were, uh, uh, who, who were there before you joined the facility, who's been a long-termer or who, doesn't like what you are showing them, telling them. So how do you engage in a situation like that? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, for this question, Chantella, uh, definitely uh, th with the help of uh, our IP, in this case, you know, Sam, he's our IP in our building. Uh, he was always making sure that we were up to date with policy, this ki uh, kind of policies and guidelines also. Also with your help, uh, you know, coming to visit us and making sure that we were up to date with those as well. So that definitely helped. And also uh, we did have some staff that uh, had to leave. They are no longer working here. So we had to hire new staff too. So, you know, it's not just uh, about having the people that work here uh, up to date, but also the new staff that come and join uh, our team, making sure that they understand these policies. If there's any uh, like questions or things that are not clear, uh, sometimes uh, we also create like conversation between our coworkers in this department to make sure, you know, if they have a question and I'm not here, there's somebody, there's somebody here that can help them uh, just to be sure that they know what they're doing and they're aware of the policies that we have. Thank you, Alex. Kelly, uh, can you give examples? I know you have done a great work with your staff. Uh, um, so even before the training, we started at your facility. Um, so now how do you engage, how did you engage as well as how do you continue to engage them? Well, I continue um, as I have done in the past is involve the staff um, so let's say perhaps we're doing an in-service on bathroom cleaning. And we go over our policy and procedure. We go over our sequence, our pattern cleaning. And then at the end, I will hand them a checklist and say, and assign everybody to two or three bathrooms to go out and do their own inspection and then report to, back to me with their feedback of what they're finding. And again, I, I just feel that it's really a good engagement to have hands on with a team and to involve them, as well as I do use the glow germ in the facility. And I do want them to um, themselves go out and apply the glow germ. I'll go with them for the after effects, and then we'll use our tools and our documentation to support that. Um, and it's just kind of fun because they're like, oh, oh, gosh, um, you know, again, just an eye opener for them to engage and to know that we're all here for a reason. And the bottom line is for the safety to not pass on a germ or infection to one another, the next resident, to the family members or to take it home yourself. Thank you, Kelly. I know I see Jocelyn, uh, um, she just joined. Jocelyn is IP for uh, uh, English Oaks. Jocelyn, I'm going to put you on the spot. And uh, as uh, Kelly was talking about, you guys have done a great job. Uh, so how, as a IP, how do you engage, uh, how do you work with Kelly to engage the EVS staff? Oh, gosh. Well, without Kelly and her team through COVID, I always like to give the credit where the credit's due. 
um, you know, they did, they did a great job of keeping our building safe and not just with COVID, with every day in DROs, with the cleaning, the building looks great. Um, Kelly has a wealth of knowledge about the EVS program um, and has worked closely with your staff as well. Um, just trying to keep things fun. I know that in the beginning of the year, we kind of did an IP skills fair and Kelly came in and brought her chocolate syrup and that was really eye-opening for the staff um, and the glow germ on the pins. And it's interesting, you know, that glow germ, it takes a lot of, you know, elbow grease to get it out. And her staff does such a wonderful job with those high touch areas. Um, really, I have to give all of the credit to Kelly. We kind of um, collaborate together, like, hey, how are we going to go about this? And it's really just um, being engaged with your staff and having that constant communication. Thank you, Jocelyn. So with that, we'll go to uh, the last question we have. Um, Alex, so what are your plans to sustain uh, your EVS staff adherence um, to IPC practices in your facility? You know, uh, as you said, you talk about the rounding. So how does your, if you can give us some examples, how your leadership has got involved, um, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, uh, definitely a staff uh, engagement. Uh, I think that's a big tool uh, for us in our building, um, you know, making sure that our staff understands and they remember, you know, every day, this is not just uh, when we have like a terminal cleaning, you know, this is something that we have to practice uh, in our everyday uh, duties here. For example, uh, we have, for example, when we have new admissions, uh, if I have a new staff and they are not uh, completely sure about the, the uh, policy that we practice, uh, you know, I always make sure I bring both uh, together, both housekeepers together, so that the one that does know can also uh, provide feedback to the one that is not sure about the policy. Also, uh, with our IP, uh, like I said, reminders, monitoring every day, uh, checking the cards every Every day, that is also something that I think is going to has been helping us a lot, and um, just uh, staff engagement, leadership engagement. Uh, you know, our IP and our administrator have been really good, making sure that we are on top of those. Uh, so, Alex, do you feel like um, <laughs> are your staff are comfortable to approach to approach you uh, if they don't have tools or if they don't have equipment uh, to come to you and then to say, hey, I need these tools to do a proper cleaning. Um, are you able? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah no, I think they are, they're very comfortable. We do have this uh, checklist in our uh, uh, housekeeping uh, closet where uh, like if I'm not around or I'm not here that day, they can easily just write it there. And that way at the end of the week, I check that. And if anything is needed, I can just either order it or go buy it, you know, just making sure that we never run out of the things that we, we need. Like for example, the chemicals that we use for cleaning, we never want to run, uh, you know, low on those. So yeah, they, they feel very, com I think they feel very comfortable uh, with letting me know and making sure that we have what we need in the building. Thank you, Alex. You mentioned about you do the daily rounds. Uh, how do you do that when you do your rounds? How do you uh, provide the feedback to your EVS staff? Is it only to that individual if you see uh, an issue or do you uh, bring them together to go over your findings? What's your process? Yeah, so uh, we start with a, a housekeeping card. That's basically our first thing that we check, you know, uh, even though it's something that we do, they do every day, uh, you know, prepare it, get ready and, and have everything ready. You know, sometimes there are things that might be missed. So, uh, you know, making sure that the card uh, looks good and it's ready to go is probably the first thing. Uh, I would say it's the first thing that I do, that I check with them. After that uh, is the rooms. We have a, basically a path that we follow uh, in our building. That way I already know, you know, which rooms have already been done, which rooms need to be done uh, after lunch, for example. So if there's anything that was missed or, or there's, uh, you know, room for improvement, definitely giving positive feedback, uh, I think is a good way to make sure that they uh, 
you know, they don't feel like they don't feel bad or they don't feel like they're not doing a good job, you know, because they are doing a good job. So just positive, giving positive feedback in a positive manner uh, has helped me with that. Thank you, Alex. Kelly, so what's your plan to sustain? You have a great program. So what's your plan to sustain the program um, for, uh, for your facility? Well, first of all, Chantella, I would just like to thank the CDPH for their involvement again with the modules. Um, I'm excited to have those all loaded so I can, um, any new staff have that program put together, show them the video. Um, my current staff, which is many of the same, um, I said by January, you guys, we will be going through the same course again. Um, and take your lead by taking them back to the room and they can do a hands-on applying the glow germ and see, oh, where did we miss, where, where we didn't miss with those modules. Um, and then again, just keep tracking of that. But I think it's really important that we do, we continue our huddle um, and our assignments. I get here a half an hour before any of the staff members come on in housekeeping, I personally make my rounds. I, I, you know, we have good programs here from um, our nursing, our IP nurse. She informs me of, again, any new um, um, isolation rooms um, that we need to tend to so I can huddle and get that report back to um, the staff as well. Um, and, you know, as Alex said, we, we do a lot of inspections and, um, not always does my staff know when I'm inspecting. I'll go into the bathrooms and, you know, in and out to all the bathrooms. If I'm seeing a trend, I take that as a note to end service, um, the staff. So, um, you know, they 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 know that, okay, this, this is a problem. And usually I feel, you know, they, they understand me well enough as I do them to be, have an open forum with our end servicing and say, you know, you guys, I've noticed this trend, you know, we have a little ring around the rosy going on in the toilets, so, <laughs> you know, as an example to that. Um, and they're very open and receptive. Oh, Kelly, I need my um, pumice stone as an example. Um, but again, I, I think, you know, the, the training as well as, like Alex said, you know, being open communication with your staff. If you're seeing a Pacific item, procedure, practice that is going wrong at the time, correction is important. It's important that we we are able, I'm able to walk up to them. Jocelyn's able to walk up to them, by the way. And again, you know, it, it, it's kind of a confidentiality program to where we're not shouting it out. We're respecting that um, employee um, and just trying to get that item corrected as soon as possible, or simply just a reminder, don't forget, by the way, um, and, and they take it very receptive to um, the corrective action. Can Thank I, you. Can I go piggyback ahead, on that? Oh, so sorry, I'd say another great thing is feedback, is listening to our staff's feedback about what they see, because you know they are on the floor, they're our frontline staff. And then as well as not only um, reminding them, but also giving them a shout out or giving, you know, having a raffle, something to show your appreciation for that staff adherence is really important. Um, Kelly's always doing fun things in her department, and we just try to keep the fun in it, but as well as adhere to all of our rules and all of our practices so we could have the very best program. Thank you, Jocelyn. Yes, she, she got the... Uh... Uh, always providing the, the positive feedback, not just the negative feedback. He's the key factor to sustain your program. And we have seen both uh, at English Oaks as well as with, uh, um, uh, River, uh, with Riverbend, uh, that has, uh, they have changed a lot of practices, even though Kelly had a very good practice. So now it's been excellent uh, example for several of the buildings in that uh, region. And um, Alex is building, so they have done Peer to peer, actually, they used to do the glow germ. The staff would place it on, and then they would uh, uh, go back and then say, Why did they place it? Why did they thought this as a high touch area? 
even for us we there was uh, it was it was very interesting so how they learned and then how they're sustaining their program thank you so much with uh, for the participant i apologize for tracy and she could not join hopefully when we have next meeting so we will bring her back uh, for the meeting so with that i will pass it on to aurora thank you everybody thank you thank you Thank you, Shantala. Excellent panel discussion. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for participating today and sharing their experiences. Let's now look at two case scenarios that could occur at your facility. Think about how you could respond to support staff IPC knowledge and implementation. So case scenario number one, so while you're conducting your daily rounds, you observe EVS staff cleaning the multi-bed occupancy room. You observe staff move from one resident bed space to the cart to get more cleaning supplies without removing their gloves and performing hand hygiene. What is wrong with this situation? Feel free to add your responses in the chat. Not changing gloves between patients, very good. Thank you for that response. Let's move to the next question. So what should the EVS staff have done instead? As you guys have mentioned, staff should have removed their gloves and perform hand hygiene after cleaning the resident bed space and before going to the cart to get more cleaning supplies. So what are your next steps as the manager or educator? There are multiple steps following the observation that you could implement. For instance, you can stop the staff and reinforce the importance of proper hand hygiene when removing their gloves to prevent further cross-contamination. You can do a just-in-time training. Just-in-time trainings that are trainings that deliver information precisely when the learner needs it. You might pull the individual staff aside to review key IPC practices, or you might also bring in nearby staff for a five-minute just-in-time training group review. Remember, you can find key messages from module one curriculum to share with your staff in a just-in-time training situation. You can conduct an in-services, uh, an in-service using materials from module one of the EVS toolkit on hand hygiene. You can provide feedback to improve adherence. Providing feedback can also improve compliance by making your staff aware that there are areas for improvement. Feedback also allows you to get a better understanding of the reasoning behind why a gap may exist and in turn more efficiently find solutions. Evaluate the staff if they have access to the tools they need to perform IPC practices. For example, the location of the alcohol-based hand wrap or the gloves are too far to reach out or were not placed on top of their cleaning cart for easy access. Evaluating if the staff has access to the tools needed to perform IPC practices is another step that you can take to better understand the reasoning behind why proper IPC implementation may not be occurring. And does anyone have any other steps they think could be taken to address the observation? Feel free to add your responses in the chat. Very good. I see a lot of responses. Stop the staff and educate the staff for proper hand washing in service. Very good. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Thanks so much, Aurora. 
So let's now watch a video which shows a scenario that may occur at your facility. Just a disclaimer, there is a fan running in this video at the beginning for those who are sensitive. All right, let's begin. So the EVS staff was assigned to clean the room, which is occupied by a very uncooperative resident who insists on keeping the fan running while the EVS staff is cleaning the room. The resident has their belongings spread out in the area that the EVS staff needs to clean. The EVS staff is able to move their items after asking the resident, but the resident continues to insist that the fan stays on. The EVS staff is concerned about proper cleaning and disinfection of the room. The staff proceeds to contact you to share their, their concerns around not being able to maintain required contact time for the disinfectant. All right, let's look at case scenario two. So after your staff contacts you to share their concerns around not being able to maintain required contact time for the disinfectant, what are your next steps as a manager or educator? Feel free to add in the chat. I'll give a few seconds. Okay, well, some next steps that you could take are you could acknowledge and thank your EVS staff for bringing their concern to your attention. We really want to empower our EVS staff to be comfortable with bringing forth concerns. You can also contact your facility IP to help provide education to the resident and their family on proper room cleaning. You can evaluate the current disinfectant for the required contact time to kill germs. And you can ensure the cleaning and disinfection policy includes language on maintaining the correct contact or wet time. For instance, fans should not be in use during this pro process. Can you guys think of any others? Feel free to add in the chat. Thank staff and provide education to the resident. Wonderful. Any others? All right. Let's move on to our next question. So what are some situations where your staff could not maintain contact or wet time and how did you handle the situation? Feel free to add that into the chat as well. All right, anyone wanna add their experience into the chat or come off mute? No worries, we will have some time in our um, questions and answers and discussion section as well for you to share your experience. Let's move on. All right, so let's now look at the EVS toolkit activities that we reviewed last week in more detail to see how you can provide them to your staff. These activities are engaging resources to reinforce EVS concepts and understanding. I'm gonna now pass it over to trainer Aurora to begin the review. Thanks, Shannon. So here's the module one activity card called Pen, Pen Pals. We reviewed this activity last week. This is a fun and engaging hands-on activity to reinforce hand hygiene concepts and to show your staff how easily germs may can spread. Although the activity card worksheets provide materials, timing, and instructions, as you can see here in an answer key. As you may remember, Sophie showed us how to download all of the activity card worksheets from the activity file last week. For module two, we have um, three activity cards worksheets available. Last week, we reviewed that picture this, what to look for in EVS closet. You can use these activity cards to reinforce understanding on module two content. Here's the activity card worksheets for module three. This uh, module has two activity card worksheets. You may also remember that last week we reviewed the spotted activity card. Today we will try the activity card called pin it. But before we do, here are, here are the activity card worksheets for module four, finding the activity cards and worksheets file. Last week, we reviewed some of the what would you do activity card. Today, we will, we will walk through the high touch surfaces, identifying who cleans what activity. Okay, so let's try modules three activity card called pin it. 
So one way you can do this activity is by projecting this activity card worksheet on a screen and review the items with your staff. You'll see each item is marked with a number. As you can see here, number one is the microfiber cloths, two disinfection wipes, three alcohol-based hand rub, four drink, five mops and wet floor sign, six bleach, bleach, and seven a spray bottle. And then you can ask your staff which items do not belong in the EVS cart. Go ahead and feel free to add your answers in the chat. You see the item numbers. I see some answers already. Okay, number four, that is correct. Never store any personal items like water bottles or food and avoid eating or snacking during cleaning for your own safety. Okay, do we see another item that shouldn't be there? Okay, I see number six. Okay, so some of you put bleach, number six. This is a tricky um, answer. You can have bleach on your cart just make sure that the bleach is pre-mixed and in a smaller container, not on a large container with concentrated bleach. Okay, and do we see another one that shouldn't be there? Okay, so we have the num item number seven, which is the spray bottle. Pour bottles are preferred over spray bottles. This is because um, spray bottles can cause aerosolization of the product, which can get into people's eyes or lead to um, breathing issues. Thank you so much for participating. Okay, so. Another way that um, you could do this activity is by printing out the worksheets for your staff, review the items with your staff, and then ask the question, where will you place each item on the EVS cleaning cart? And then you can ask your staff to draw an arrow pointing from the item to where they, could, they will place each item in the cleaning cart. You can give them five or 10 minutes um, to do this activity. And then you can discuss the answers with rationale to reinforce understanding. So let's give this activity card a try. So where will you place each item on the EVS card? Add your responses in the chat. Where will you place your microfiber cloths, for example? Okay, inside the card. Very good. That is correct. So microfiber cloths can be placed inside a cart or on top of a bin. Remember that dry uh, microfiber cloths are kept inside the cart to keep clean and dry. And microfiber cloths in use should be placed in a bin on top of the cart saturated in disinfectant. Let's do another one. Where will you place your alcohol-based hand rub? Yes, number one on top of the cart. Very good. That is correct. Um, accessible HBHR at the top of the cart makes it easier for hand hygiene. Very good. Let's do the last one. Where will you place your mops and wet, wet floor signs? Very good, I see that outside. On the side, very good. Correct, so the, the mops and wet floor signs should be uh, placed either in the front deck or outside. So the rationale is that mops, mops with removable mop heads or floor mops should be switched out between each room or when grossly, grossly uh, soil. The buckets, the wet floor, caution sign, signs, and bags for soil, linen, and trash are stored outside for accessibility and efficiency of use. 
Thank you so much. You can continue reviewing each item um, of the worksheet with your staff. And just note that sometimes the um, cleaning cart may vary from facility to facility. Thanks so much, Aurora. Let's now try module four's identify who cleans what worksheet. What are some of the high touch services in your facility that are cleaned by your EVS staff? Name two to three and put them in the chat. I'll give a few moments for everyone to participate. I'm not seeing anything in the chat so far. Bed rail, call button, light switches, bed rail. Seeing lots of bed rails and call buttons, guardrails and hallways, TV remotes, privacy curtains, light switches, side table. Wonderful participation, windows. Glucometer for licensed nurses, room door handles, PPE cart, room door handle. Wonderful. Great responses. Thank you all. All right. Let's move on to the next slide. So now that we've identified some high touch services, you can also use this tool as a way to support your staff in understanding who cleans what. Knowing who cleans what is essential to make sure there are no gaps in cleaning and disinfecting. Let's look at some, some items on this list and think about who may clean what at your facility. Is it nursing, EVS staff, respiratory therapy, or volunteers? No, persons responsible might vary from facility faci facility um, and could vary also depending on daily or terminal cleaning as well. So let's look at some items and think about who's going to clean this. Let's try it out. I'm going to highlight these items in purple and in the chat, say if it's either one nursing, two EVS staff, three RT or four volunteers that are responsible for cleaning them. Let's try it out. Let's see the first item. All right, so for bathroom, who's cleaning that? See a lot of people are putting two, which would be EVS staff. Two, two, great. Yes, so bathroom is going to be EVS staff. Let's try the next one. What about bed rails? I'm seeing one, two. Oh, there's a little bit of a mix here. Some people are just saying two. EVS and CNA, two, two. So I am seeing a mix here. And actually everyone on this list could clean the bed rail. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of dual responsibilities, but great participation. How about we move over to um, floors? Who cleans the floors? Two. Seeing a lot of EVS staff, too. Perfect, yes. So EVS staff are going to be the ones that clean this floor. I am seeing there is a mix here. Once again, it can vary from facility to facility. Um, how about we try IV pump? One, one nurse, one. Great, great response. Very good. Nurse. A nurse would be the one that would be cleaning this one. Let's do one more. How about privacy curtains? Two, two, EVS. Yep, two. Wonderful participation, everyone. So you could do something similar to what we just did with your staff to reinforce these concepts and emphasize dual responsibilities as well as teamwork at your facility. You can make the worksheet into a quiz card, badge buddy, or use it in a daily huddle or have it laminated and filled out on the cart for your staff to reference. Thank you all so much for your participation. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Shantala who's going to lead us through a discussion of some of the questions we received last week. Thank you, Shannon. Um... Uh, if uh, time permits, we'll go over other questions, uh, um, additional questions. Uh, the one of the question was, we have a carpet in our rooms. Uh, what's the best uh, practice to, you know, for terminal cleaning? Do we have an EPA registered product for a C. difficile that will not destroy the carpet? So we were able to reach out to a few of the vendors and then the CDC, uh, so we're still working on to get if there is any product available. Uh, so it's a as you know, carpet is harder to keep it clean, especially if there is any spills of blood and body substances. So you really need to have a policy and uh, policy to 
uh, not to use the carpet, as I said, yes. Uh, but some of you have the carpet. So then with that, so since uh, what is the best process? So uh, some of them have the, the uh, where you can re remove the square ones, where you can remove each of those squares and then replace it. But that is difficult. So you really need to have a process to remove the uh, gross contamination and then clean it. But it is, since if it is not fully, uh, uh, if it cannot be fully decontaminated, so then you really need to look at whether to remove that carpet. Um, so I could not find uh, EPA approved disinfectant product to use it on the carpet for C. diff purpose. Uh, but uh, we will be, we are reached, we reached out to several of the vendors to see if they have any product available or if it is coming in the market, in the pipeline. So we will bring it back this answer uh, to more uh, clear answer uh, um, when we post our FAQs on the website. Um, the next question. Uh, it was, uh, the, it, this question came up a lot uh, for the hopper. Um, so we use hoppers for cleaning soil linen in the facilities, particularly after cleaning extra feces off the bed pad um, or uh, periwash before placing it in the laundry. So we did a lot of research again. So you gave us a lot of homework. And with that, so um, again, so you really need to train, uh, train your staff on removing the large volumes of stool um, uh, from the cloth prior to placing in the laundry system. But again, so we don't want them to be shaking, right? So then, uh, you know, the hopper, you don't have any um, uh, uh, um, splash guard. So it is, I know it is deep and it is down. So when you're trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, dump uh, the large amount of stool, so then it's there is will be always be splash and splatter. Does your staff are using proper PP? Do they have access to proper PP before uh, they uh, they had to dump everything to the hopper and not to uh, agitate the uh, the sheets so that there is no exposure to their clothing and uh, they're not if there is no aerosolization. Uh, especially if it is a seat of patient's room, you know, like it's, you really need to look at a uh, process to work with your uh, infection prevention is to come up with how do we prevent the blood and body fluid exposure to your staff, right? So that's something you had to, uh, and before it goes back to you. So the other uh, options you have is using the disposable uh, uh, pads, right? So disposable pads, a disposable wa washcloth where you don't need to uh, take it back to the laundry. So you have uh, alternative options uh, um, if you're uh, for your, instead of using the reusable um, uh, cotton cloth or uh, other stuff. So you can try to use the disposable one. So to, especially when you had to remove the large amount of stool. Um, and again, so we'll have much uh, more uh, uh, clarification and uh, information available when we post our, these questions on our FAQ uh, on the website. Um, next question. Uh, again, uh, um, so yes, there is a one comment. Uh, this should be done in the laundry dirty area. Um, your, yes, um, pay the laundry dirty area where you have a hopper, where you have, uh, uh, so again, you also need to look at not only like uh, when you're doing it, um, a, um, exposure to your employees. That's the key, exposure to your employees. Um, and for a discharged resident room, uh, they sent, this was a facility who sent, they sent the pillowcases to the laundry and they wanted to see how to clean, uh, how to properly clean the pillows. Again, so you should have a policy for per manufacturer guidelines, right? So do you need to make sure does it uh, those pillows are uh, single use or is it uh, reusable, right? So then if it is a reusable, so then you have to use a hospital grade disinfectant for soft surfaces um, um, and to make sure that it is uh, clear. The staff also need to look at if there is any damage or if it is visibly soiled, whether it is washable or not washable. So you have to have a policy to look looking at uh, uh, what products, like the type of product you have uh, in the uh, in the room, and uh, uh, if it is uh, something which is not wipeable, not washable, it should be designated to that uh, resident and then discard um, when it is uh, uh, visibly soiled or uh, when the patient get discharged. Uh, so um, it's you had to make the decision based upon 
what type of uh, um, pillows you have in your building. Uh, next question. So can we keep uh, toilet brushes in the resident room? If not, how should they be stored in uh, on the cleaning cart? So this question came uh, came up a lot uh, during our all our sessions and then even when we go to our facilities. Uh, based upon what we receive the input from our licensing and certification team, you can keep uh, the toilet brush in the uh, uh, patient in the resident bathroom. The only caveat is you really need to do a risk assessment for that uh, safety for that resident, right? So somebody who has a dementia, somebody who has a memory uh, so in the memory care unit, you don't want to uh, keep the toilet brush because that can become a weapon or that can, we don't know how they're going to uh, uh, utilize, use that uh, uh, um, um, the toilet brush. So the options you have is uh, to make sure that they have uh, um, uh, when to uh, disposable in certain rooms, you can have a disposable toilet brush head, so which is uh, easier. Uh, to uh, manage, then if you're using the uh, reusable toilet brush, you need to show the, those brushes should be cleaned thoroughly after each use, stored in the toilet brush holder and to hair dry completely. Because you had to think about, right, so when it was used in an isolation room and then it come, uh, if you bring it back to the cart and then uh, you have it, um, I, I've, we have seen um, you have those uh, sometimes um, the container, the plastic container, um, it is, and then you have, uh, you still have water in there. There is uh, some, some people will have bleach solution in there. So, and when you, after cleaning the uh, toilet, so the, those brush comes back to the cart and you also consider about the waterborne pathogens, right? So you're taking once uh, something, uh, germs from one patient uh, resident room to another resident room onto the cart. Uh, so we really need to be uh, uh, looking at how are we spreading the germs, not just through healthcare worker hands and um, and what goes into the resident room, what, but what comes out to the resident room and then it is go to the different uh, rooms, right? So you had to uh, come up with a protocol uh, working with your leadership to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, whether you want to go through the disposable uh, toilet, br toilet brush heads or do you work with your IP and the nursing team to see whether you can say, keep it in your, uh, uh, in the, inside the um, uh, resident uh, bathroom. Uh, again, uh, so you had to, you had to evaluate uh, uh, your facility, um, patient population and uh, other factors and make the decision. Your goal is to making sure you're not cross-contaminating and you're not creating a situation for waterborne pathogens because you're taking, you're dipping that and then taking it back to another room, right? So um, with that, I think that's our last questions. We have, there were several questions came up, uh, but uh, I think we are running out time. Um, let's see, um, we will bring it back again. The cleaning sequence, a proper cleaning sequence was one of the questions. I see it on the chat, 